My name is Michelle Sabat, and I'm the author of two brat memoir style books. Um, the first was called Camp Follower, One Army Brat Story, and I would like to read to you today a chapter from my new release called First We Eat, Food, Life and More Stories, and the chapter I'm going to read to you tonight from is Drink, Drink. Drinks are, of course, an ever-present part of some people's consumption, mine included. By drinks, I don't mean glasses of water or milk or pop served with meals. Yes, pop, not soda is what I call carbonated drinks like Coke. I mean drinks for drinking's sake, as a food, as its own reward, so to speak. Pop was never a standalone beverage in our home. It was mostly used as a mix for my parents' alcohol, and it was Coke, 7-Up, or ginger ale only. Or the same pop choices were a treat at the movie theater with popcorn. It could be bought with allowance money outside the home, but I didn't choose it often over chocolate or crayons. The first place I remember drinking pop for true pleasure was as a little kid, maybe six, in Calgary, getting root beer at A&W. What a flavor. I can't describe it now other than as tasting like root beer, but then poured over ice cream as a float. It was scrumptious, a vanilla smoothness and fizzy eruption releasing delicate aromas that I can still taste in memory. My mouth waters just describing it. But when I was seven, my sergeant father got moved with his family to Germany. No root beer there in the mid-1960s, if I recall correctly. What they had in Germany was Fanta, orange and grape. The orange was so juicy and orangey that it conjured Christmas with each sip. But it felt so spicy how the carbonation hurt my mouth, I never really became an addict. In fact, if I could get away with it, I'd shake the glass bottle to get rid of the fizz. But of course, this was tricky if you didn't want to lose most of it through the resulting explosion. It was not a maneuver one could handle in the movie theater, for example, which was where I drank my pop. By the time I lived in Goose Bay, I still didn't like pop much. Once in a while, I'd buy a Tahiti treat can from the pop machine at the base movie theater to sip throughout the movie. It was pink cream soda. I can still remember the can design, white with pink and green palm trees. Then I discovered the pop dispensing machine at the American side movie theater. The United States had a big Air Force base in Goose Bay in the late 1960s. Their concession offered 10 times the selection of our Canadian side theater concession. Chocolate bars and candy lined a wall, colorful and foreign, especially having just come from post-war Germany. I had my first Butterfinger chocolate bar there. The Americans had a soda pop tank, not unlike those of today, that you push little metal levers to release the choice of liquid into your own paper cup. It seemed a wonderful idea to pour your own, and I soon invented, well, everyone did, swamp water at the soda pop machine. A little splash of Coke, add some orange, ginger ale, even some water to cut the carbonation, for me. No ice again, for me. Wonderful and different every time. I wouldn't drink much more pop in my youth until diet drinks hit the shelves, and young women of my time were expected to be thin, ridiculous as that was. Tab and Fresca arrived, again, too fizzy for me, and the Fresca could melt your teeth with acidity. But at least, along with skim milk, drinks were becoming available as lighter on calories. I admit that I sometimes drank these pops for taste. I did like the tinny tang in the diet drinks of that time, before they stopped using saccharin due to bladder cancer studies in rats, as if aspartame was any better for you. As a young mother in the 1980s, fruit drinks and juices were still popular to feed our children, not like today when juice is considered a sugary evil. By fluke, I was ahead of the curve then to cut the apple juice with water, admittedly because I myself found it too sweet, not because I was some kind of anti-sugar advocate. I've already mentioned my first son also disliked too much sweet, so he wouldn't drink juice at full strength anyway. So it was, with, it was with Darcy that I developed versions of a new kind of swamp water. Mommy, Daddy's gone to school. Can we have our special drink now, please? It was a Tuesday evening, and Don, my husband, was finishing up his university degree with night classes, after work, after supper, after baby Sasha was asleep for the first half of his night, before midnight feeding. It was Mommy and Darcy's special hour in Winnipeg, Manitoba in 1990. Okay, get the juice and pop from the fridge. I'll get the glasses. Big, tall, plastic patio ones with colorful patterns, probably full of BPA, bisphenol, a chemical additive to food containers that eventually, eventually would be banned from plastic baby bottles due to hormonal influences. Blissfully unaware of that and bladder cancer risks, I reached above Darcy to the freezer for the tray of ice cubes. He was pulling the pop out from the fridge. At almost four years old, he was big and strong and could easily handle the two-liter bottle of Diet Coke even when it was full. 
More ice, Mommy. I want four. I set the ice tray down and reached above the sink to the cabinet containing the Bacardi. I didn't mind a lot of ice in my rum and coke myself. Get the lime and lemon from the fridge. Now, honey. No, don't get the knife. I'll do that. I poured the coke and rum. No rum in Darcy's. I wasn't that bad of a mother. In our glasses over the ice. I put the ice tray back in the top freezer shelf, noting that the freezer needed defrosting again. Yes, I was that bad of a housekeeper that it was a task that always needed doing. Lemon and lime slices squeezed and added, orange or grapefruit juice or both added to Darcy's special drink, everything put back in the fridge. Off we headed to the basement family room to settle down in front of the TV on the futon we used as a guest bed, propped up with blankets to snuggle and TV tables on the sides where we set our drinks. Our favorite weekly ritual show, Tour of Duty, was about to start. Darcy and Mummy settled in for our hour, sipping and singing along to the theme song, Painted Black, before all the cool army and action scenes of the episode. Years pass. Painted Black got redone as a Rolling Stones cover by Gob. Darcy moved out and into his own home to start his own family. Don and I now get together nightly for a few hours of TV before bed in our condo on our nice leather couches and comfy chairs. I don't need the blankets to snuggle anymore, like I did in the basement in Winnipeg, but I still like to. And before we settle, I mix us each a special drink, mine a wine cocktail nowadays, and expensive pure pure cherry juice and diet lemonade for him. Ice from the frost-free fridge, thank goodness for progress in appliances, with added lemon slices and frozen cherries. A co-worker once mentioned that cherries were good for people prone to gout. I've always known that what we eat can be medicinal, but sometimes Don still suffers from gout anyway. And although I've mentioned them in this story, alcoholic drinks, like coffee, deserve their own, sa- their own section and chapter. <laughs>